All right, all right, all right. It is time to get the Virtual Science Cafe started. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Virtual Science Cafe. I am your host for tonight. My name is Chris. Normally, I am curator of the SSCU Daily Planet Theater at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh. That's this part of the museum. Nice big globe right there. Uh, on a bright normal day, you could find us inside the museum doing all kinds of great fun programs, but conditions being what they are, we're not at the museum right now. The museum downtown is closed at the moment, but that doesn't mean that we have to stop bringing you all the great science goodness that you know and love from this museum. I am joined by a very special guest, Dr. Tom Collin. Tom is a paleontology postdoctoral researcher with North Carolina State University and with us at the Paleontology Research Lab in the Museum of Natural Sciences. Tom, welcome. Thanks. Thanks. Great to be here. How are things in uh, your part of North Carolina? Um, I'm actually not in North Carolina right now. Um, oh, okay. In, 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 yeah, I'm, uh, I'm actually up in, in Canada at the moment, but uh, I've been quarantining up here for the last couple months. Oh, well, that's exciting. See, this yeah. is what is great about doing <laughs> virtual science cafes, because we can get great people from anywhere in the world to connect yeah. with us on the internet. But yes, usually I would be also in Raleigh. <laughs> yeah. Usually I could go knock on your office door, right? Yeah, exactly. Be right at the glass, being able to see, be seen by anyone coming into the museum. Surrounded by all of the fossil matrices and the casts of our dinosaurs hanging out in the museum. The cool triceratops skull that uh, Eric was working on before we all had to leave the lab. I know. I was very invested in his work on that skull. It is looking great. I can't wait to see more of it when we can when we can get back to it. Uh, so everybody, before we jump into the show, I uh, want to let everybody know that if you enjoy the talk, like the video, let other people know what's going on. So share, tweet it. The museum is at Natural Sciences on social media. I think, uh, Tom, you're on Twitter too, right? I am, yeah. What's your, what's your username? So people can be like, it's, this uh... is great. It's Cullen underscore Thomas, so it's just like my name in reverse. There you so go, everybody. Someone managed to get to the uh, first last name before me. Right. <laughs> my name is Chris Smith, so welcome to my travels. Uh, so everybody, we're going to hear a great presentation tonight about dinosaurs and the ecosystems that they lived in. Tom has done dinosaur paleontology on almost every continent, in the Arctic, in the Antarctic, uh, I even read in his bio that he was a consultant on Sue the T-Rex's permanent exhibit at the Field Museum in Chicago, Chicago. So I think we've got an expert in the house tonight. I'm very excited to learn more. I hope that you are too. If you have questions or comments throughout the talk, put those in the chat over there. And after the presentation, we'll be grabbing your questions and comments to pose to our guest speaker and get Tom's thoughts about what you're thinking about. With all of that said, uh, I will ask everyone to please be nice. This is the internet. That's a chat box. Please be respectful of others, of our guests. Let's have a nice, cool science discussion tonight. Tom, are you ready? I am. Take it away. All right, thanks. Thanks for the introduction. So tonight I'll be talking about some of my research. Um, about how we're able to put together dinosaur ecosystems and sort out the world of dinosaurs. In this case, I'm saying using a combination of things like um, fossil deposits, lasers, um, geology, and put all those things together to understand um, what were dinosaurs doing, how do they interact with each other, what was their world like. And um, so to get started, Chris has already done a good job of introducing me, um, but just briefly, who I am, who I am. Um, I came from uh, Ottawa, Canada, did a master's in uh, bachelor's of science over there, working with Canadian Museum of Nature, and then moved on to the University of Toronto, where I did a lot of the research I'm going to be talking about tonight, uh, before I went and recently did a postdoc, uh, sort of two-year post-PhD contract at the Field Museum in Chicago. That's where I got to work on Sue the T-Rex. And then I'm really happy that since 
um, the start of this year, I've been down working here in North Carolina at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences with Lindsay Zano, the uh, chief paleontologist here. So one of my favorite things about doing field work um, is the, or sorry, favorite things about doing science is that I get to do all this field work. So um, my research, as Chris mentioned, has taken me to a lot of interesting places. My primary work is in the Western interior of North America, particularly Montana and Alberta. It's been a lot of my focus, um, though I've been really fortunate to be able to go up to a lot of places like the Arctic, the Antarctic, Argentina, um, and a number of other cool spots. And one of the things that um, you might notice is in common with pictures from a lot of these areas where we're looking for fossils, looking for dinosaurs, is that they're really barren. So where we find uh, fossils today of dinosaurs is not in exclusively, but almost always these sort of deserty, badlandy type environments. Um, and the reasons for that are sort of threefold, um, but primarily related to just needing open barren ground where you can find fossils coming out. Like if there's a forest on top of the ground, even if there's a dinosaur right beneath you, you'll never know it's there because it might be 10, 15 feet underground full of roots and forest and trees and stuff. So whereas if you have these areas here, like deserts and badlands, where there's really high erosion and very little big plant cover, um, any fossils that might be there, you can actually see with your eyes and, and be able to dig up. So that's sort of why we look in these areas today for dinosaurs, but the, the world the dinosaurs are actually living in was quite different um, than what those landscapes look like today. So this is, this is a picture here from Southern Alberta, and it's quite hot and dry in the summer, cold in the winter, but when dinosaurs were there, what did it look like? So here's something you are all probably pretty familiar with, what our world looks like today. But if we go back in time, 75 million years, it looks like this. So a couple of major differences. Continents are still more or less in the, in the same places, but there's not really a whole lot of snow. There's not a lot of ice. You look at the poles, um, they're green. Sea levels are much, much higher. A lot of the continents have these big inland seas, sort of like the Mediterranean, but stretched across pretty much all of them, not just Europe. And Europe itself is almost entirely underwater. Um, and the reason for this is that at the time, not the entire time dinosaurs were around, but this particular time at least, uh, we were in what's called a greenhouse climate. And so that's, think like what's been projected for our own climate change, but really, really far like to the extreme. So no polar ice at all, much, much higher sea levels, average temperatures way higher, much, much higher carbon dioxide. Um, to give an example of, the, of how that affects animals, um, from this time period, you can find things like crocodiles, relatives of crocodiles and alligators up in the Arctic. So quite a bit different from today where their they're sort of northernmost range that something like an alligator would get would be something like North Carolina. And a lot of my research focuses on this little part of it here in Western North America. And that was an area of really fantastic dinosaur um, diversity. We, we know dozens and dozens and dozens of species of dinosaurs, many of them that coexisted from the fossil skeletons we find. Uh, but this world they're living in was very, um, very extreme, very interesting because you have to the east here, this shallow seaway. So it's cutting off a bunch of the land. You have a narrow strip of coastal plain, roughly where that star is going up and down north, south along the coast. And then just immediately to the west of that, you have what at the time, well, it was still the Rocky Mountains, but they were actually starting to grow then. That's when they were volcanically active a lot more. That's when they were um, even taller than they are today. And that's when they, a lot of that was actually forming. And so you had very volcanically active, tectonically active, fast growing mountains to the west of them, pulling out tons of erosion um, into the rivers in these coastal plains that were then going into, the, into these shallow seaways. And that creates a very dynamic environment that these dinosaurs were living in. We know that from the rock record. But how do we actually determine what this ecosystem was like? We know that it um, roughly what the environment was like, but how did the actual ecosystem uh, get structured? How did the dinosaurs and the other animals cope in this sort of setting? Um, how did their populations and the populations of other animals they coexisted with vary across those landscapes? Um, and, and how do we get at that information? Well, one of the ways that I get at it is what's uh, called a vertebrate uh, microfossil bone bed or a microsite. And so 
these sites are really useful um, for reconstructing ecology because they give you something that full skeletons don't. So full skeletons are obviously of critical importance to any kind of dinosaur paleontology. Um, we need to, like a good um, skeleton of an animal to actually understand its anatomy, its biology, um, define it what's a new species compared to other species. But the problem is that those are sort of point samples. That might be one individual or a, a small bone bed of a, a few dozen individuals um, of the same species at a given time. And then if you sample another skeleton above it in the, in the rock record, even a few meters, maybe like 10 feet above it, that might actually correlate in terms of time to something like 100,000 years. So these animals had a, a, might have had a real gulf of time between them. What you want is to be able to sample um, many dozens of different species and potentially hundreds of fossils in a single place at a single time. And that's what these sites give you. So these um, microsites represent ancient wetlands, ancient river channels. And when you find them in the field, when you're walking around, you see little tiny teeth, uh, little bones, scales, all sort of eroding out together. And these represent animals that had lived in that area, died, and then gradually accumulated in these wetlands over a period of say a few uh, um, decades or centuries. And while centuries are still a lot of time, um, on a geologic scale, it's like a blink of an eye. And compared to the resolution we have from other fossil data, which is often, as I said, on the scale of hundreds of thousands of years, um, this sort of gives us an invaluable sample of um, a snapshot of an ecosystem at a single time and place. And so the way we, we collect these things in the field, the way we find them um, is, like I said, you find sort of a pavement of bones and teeth coming out of the ground. And once you've identified that, you then, if you're particularly lucky, have a bunch of volunteers or young students who can help you with this, with strong young backs. And you come there with a bunch of grain bags, sort of 50 pound bags, and you fill those with the sediment. And then you bring 30, 40, maybe 50 bags back uh, with you to the lab. And then you start screen washing them. And so that's to separate the, the sediment, the sand and the mud from the fossils. And so you use a stacked series of sieves and we do this a lot at the North Carolina Museum. Um, we're currently processing a ton of material of this sort of nature. And we're actually starting to develop citizen science programs around that. So that's something to look forward to for those of you who are sort of in the area. Um, but the way it works is you sort of have all these sieves, you run them through water, you concentrate down all the fossils into a smaller package, and then you can actually start identifying those often under a microscope because some of them are pretty small. Um, when you're really young or if you just have really good eyes, you can just do it by, by sight. And I'm still able to do that for the most part for the stuff that isn't really, really small, but um, it's not gonna be long before I'll probably have to use a microscope for everything as well. And that's just the natural order of things, I guess. But once you've identified all of this material, um, you can actually then reconstruct that ecosystem. And so to give you a, a sort of example of the type of stuff that looks like here on the screen, um, let me move this out of the way. Here are examples of some of the the bones and teeth that we might find in a site. This is from a, a site that I described in 2016. Um, this particular site represents an environment that was sort of transitional between um, sort of coastal area and a more inland river. So it's on that like the edge of those two environments. And so you get a mix of um, animals from both ecosystems. And so from this, we have things like teeth from uh, these things called guitar fish. They're a relative of uh, like stingrays. In this case, these are ones that are primarily um, freshwater. We have garfish, um, we have bowfin, so fish that are still around today. We would get sometimes some sharks from here. We've got a lot of turtles, five or six different um, groups of turtles. Um, various different vertebrae from fish, lizards, uh, snakes, amphibians, uh, as well as tons and tons of teeth. And so the teeth we get range from things like crocodilians, uh, relatives of alligator, uh, meat-eating dinosaurs like tyrannosaurs and, and raptors, um, horn dinosaur teeth, duckbill dinosaur teeth, and um, armored um, dinosaur teeth, like things like ankylosaurs and notosaurs. And we can take all the information from this together, combine it with um, information we have from the rock record, things like um, the type of environment from the type of sediment, or whether what kind of rivers are there. Um, from the sediment, we can also get things like pollen to figure out what kind of plants were there. And we can combine that with some of the big skeletons we find and put all those things together. And we can form um, something like this. This is an artistic reconstruction uh, by my friend Danielle uh, Dufault of um, what the ecosystem would have looked like 
around the sort of Montana Alberta border about 75 million years ago. And so in this picture, you can see a bunch of different dinosaurs you might recognize. There's Ornithomimus, uh, Gorgosaurus, um, there's Alambiosaur, Stracosaurus, there's Zool, this Ankylosaur over here. Um, there's little turtles in the corner, crocodilians. And again, we, we can build all this up because we have these little fossils to actually pinpoint what each group uh, was that was there at that exact time sharing that space. So here we examples of teeth from these animals, um, teeth from crocodilians, turtle shells, teeth and, and um, limb elements from some of these other theropod dinosaurs. And again, that, that builds together to make this whole picture. But when it comes to our research, we don't want to stop there. We don't want to just look at um, how um, a single space looked and what the ecosystem was like as a static thing. We want to understand how those ecosystems were changing, how the animals in them were evolving, um, and how all that relates to um, the sort of world and the environment they were living in. And that's, again, where these microsites can be of a lot of help to us and forms a lot of the core of my research, um, because we actually will quantify how many of each different species lives in each one of these sites, and then through a series of mathematical statistical comparisons, we'll actually track changes in those sites through time um, and across the landscape. So we'll sample sometimes sites that are in roughly the same place, but over a long period of time, different places in the geologic record. Um, in this case, we had something like 30 or 40 sites representing um, a couple million years. Or we'll sample sites that are all at the exact same level or roughly the same level in the rock record, but over maybe 50 or 100 kilometers and get um, a rough gradient of, of how that landscape changes. And that gets to sort of some of the questions that were driving our work, um, which well, aside from wanting to just reconstruct the ecosystem itself, we were curious um, to try and explain some of the interesting patterns that have been noted among dinosaurs in the late Cretaceous of Western North America in the last 30 or 40 years. And one of those big patterns is there are a lot of large herbivores. So at any given time, there's often several species of large uh, duck-billed dinosaurs, hadrosaurs, um, horned dinosaurs, the ceratopsians, or um, the armored dinosaurs, things like ankylosaurs. You'll often have many species of these coexisting at a single place. Um, and across North America, you'll have even more than that with uh, potential biogeographic segregation of different groups. And when we compare that to something like um, Sub-Saharan Africa in the type of large mammal communities that live there now, um, we can see a lot of parallels, but we can also see that there seems to be a larger amount of large dinosaurs, um, large herbivorous dinosaurs around at this time of the Cretaceous than there are coexisting large mammals around in places like Sub-Saharan Africa. And the animals in Africa often have very large ranges. The animals can go hundreds or thousands of miles um, across their sort of territories and their, their ranges, whereas a lot of these dinosaurs from the fossil record appear to have relatively small ranges by comparison, only a fraction of the size. And so a long-standing question has been, um, how exactly do you fit all of these different large dinosaurs in a relatively small area? How are they doing that without avoiding, uh, or, or how are they avoiding competing with each other too much for resources? And one of the long-standing ideas for how they're doing that has been that certain species um, might prefer coastal areas, so things like um, Ceratopsians have been suggested to prefer coastal areas, and things like hadrosaurs have been suggested to prefer more inland forested areas. And so what we wanted to do is use our microsite data where we actually can already reconstruct these ecosystems and actually try to test this question. Do we see evidence um, of this differential use of, of habitat between these groups of dinosaurs in, that, in those microsites? And the place we chose to test that um, was what's called the Belly River Group in Southern Alberta. And so this is just across the border from Montana. Um, it's the same rocks that are exposed in Montana in what's called the Judith River Formation. They're the exact same rocks. The name just changes because um, of the border. And the Belly River Group is split into three formations. Um, the foremost, Old Man and Dinosaur Park. The Dinosaur Park might be familiar to some people because that, that's like a relatively famous um, dinosaur deposit, very, very rich, similar in terms of diversity of dinosaurs to something like the Hell Creek Formation. Um, where T-Rex comes from. And the reason we chose to work in this particular area for testing our hypotheses is sort of twofold. Um, the first is that 
because the areas are so rich in fossils, we have an absolute abundance of material to work with for our studies, but also um, for looking at how these things um, might pre prefer different habitats, we actually can record a major environmental transition through this interval of time. So at the bottom of this group, it's fully marine. The rocks um, suggest everything was sort of marine, underwater. And then over the course of that formless formation, over a period of several hundred thousand years, you actually have a shift in local sea level that drops down and you shift to more coastal environments, which then become even more uh, terrestrial. By the old man formation, you sort of shift to having these sort of river environments, inland, foresty areas. And it stays like that for a while before the top of the dinosaur park formation where it shifts back, sea level rises again, and the whole area becomes more coastal and wet and then gets fully inundated again, becoming uh, first estuarine and then fully marine. And that's perfect for our question because that means we can sample a bunch of sites in the same area over this whole span. And we would expect from that that if ceratopsians, for example, prefer coastal areas, they, would, they should be more prevalent in sites when we have more coastal environments. And then as we shift to more inland environments, we should see more hadrosaurs. And so the two questions we wanted to directly test with our data, the first um, is more pr the practical question, can we actually use the, these microsites to get at this question? Um, when we look at the ecosystems and we track how they change, are we actually tracking discrete changes related to the environment at all? Or do we not have maybe the resolution with the fossils to do that? So that's the first question. And assuming we can actually do it, then the second question becomes, um, do we see these environmental patterns that other people have previously proposed? And so the data set we used was um, 48 of these microsites having about 54 species in common, um, about 75,000 fossils in total, and um, across from the this region and over this time span. And um, this is what the analysis looks like. I won't go into all the nitty gritty details of the, the math and stuff behind it, but um, basically on the, the left with the blue box is the microsites that we sampled through this whole time span from um, Dinosaur Provincial Park, which is about 100 and 150 kilometers north of the border to Montana. And then in the red box is sites from the same age in the same time period, um, but sampled from right along the border. So we get a little bit of geographic separation, but both sites or both sets of sites cover the whole span of time we're interested in. And then the sort of curves in the middle there is us um, comparing the proportion of different animals in each site to the next closest site and seeing how similar or different these sites are from site to site. And what the colored bars actually correspond to is what animals are there. So I'll zoom in on one here. You can see these colors correspond to the major groups that are there. So the dark blues um, are sharks and rays, light blues are different fish, greens are amphibians, um, the browns to light purples are your turtles, lizards, crocodiles, things like that, other reptiles. And then once you get into the, the full purple, it's dinosaurs and red is mammals. And so we only really see one significant pattern happening in here, um, and it's a major similarity drop uh, corresponding to an environmental change. And that happens two times. The first is at the very uh, near the bottom, and that's where we have that big sea level drop where it goes from marine conditions to terrestrial conditions. And then we have a, a similar drop in similarity between the ecology of the sites at the very top, where we become inundated with seawater again, everything gets marine. And the thing that's driving that is the abundance of these animals. So um, chondrichthians and amphibians, and so chondrichthians are things like sharks and rays. And so it's probably not too surprising that when we drop in sea level and don't have a lot of seawater around anymore, we have a lot fewer um, sharks and rays in our sites. And we have a lot more animals that are tolerant, or um, sorry, intolerant to, uh, to salt. So things like amphibians don't like salt water. So as soon as the salt water is gone, they show up in big numbers. And then you see the opposite happening at the top. They start disappearing and all the sharks and rays are coming back in as we're getting more coastal settings again. And again, that's really obvious. Of course, when you get inundated with seawater, you're gonna have marine animals. But the important thing about that is that it shows that we actually can use the data to track environmental changes. And so that now allows us to be confident that when we look at the dinosaur patterns, they might, well, they might be actually meaningful and not just random noise.
And so when we do that and we separate those same data out between non-dinosaurs and dinosaurs and analyze the same pattern, we find actually that there is no strong shift in the dinosaurs with respect to the environment. Um, so this is kind of surprising and it's the opposite of what we would have expected based on these previous hypotheses um, because it suggests that the ceratops and the hadrosaurs were probably living in the same habitats and they were not strongly um, stuck to one sort of habitat or the other. So the ceratopsians were not tracking those coastal areas. The hadrosaurs were not necessarily tracking the inland areas. They were just all there together in relatively similar abundances throughout this major shift in sea level and environment. And um, before we sort of call it like a case closed, we wanted to, to make sure that, um, that we were sure about this signal. And so the next step was to sort of analyze down now instead of looking at the sort of broader scale patterns that we were just describing among dozens of sites to actually uh, shrink down and look at a single site in a lot of fine detail. And the way we chose to do that is by um, looking at the chemistry of the bones and teeth of the animals that were there. And I alluded earlier to lasers at the beginning and that's where they come in. So that's where we start using what's called stable isotope analysis. And so um, the way this works is that their chemical composition of your tissues in your body, uh, your bones and your teeth will actually vary slightly um, in certain elements um, and in the what are called stable isotopes, the non. So when all people think isotopes, they think of radioactive isotopes that will decay over time, um, the like such as the type that are used in like carbon dating. But that's th this that's a different kind. Those are the non-stable isotopes. The stable ones occur just naturally in the environment, and there'll be um, certain ones that are more common and other ones that are less common, and they'll be slightly heavier or lighter than each other. And um, because we know some of the background environmental levels of these we can actually use um, the values of them that occur in your tissues to figure things out about the animal's biology. And the way, we act, the way we measure this is I take these little fossils from the site, from the microsite, bring them to the lab, and I put them under in this little metal chamber and put it into the laser. And you can see the little gif there. We actually uh, line it up and fire a laser at it. It vaporizes a small place on the surface, makes a little crater. In this case, it's vaporizing a fish scale. and um, the gas that's emitted when it vaporizes that part of the of the bone or the scale or the tooth goes up and is then measured and um, the differences in chemical composition and the proportions of these different isotopes are are then measured by the by the mass spectrometer and this i'm not going to go through this whole slide this is super complicated but this is giving a this is actually a simplified version of um, some of the factors that go into um, the, the differences in, in stable isotope ratios or compositions in, um, in your tissues of your body or an animal's body. So it largely factors down to being what you eat and what you drink and to a small extent what you breathe will um, provide the raw materials that your body uses to actually grow tissues. And so because of that, like I had said before, the sources of those things are going to uh, change a little bit um, depending on what you're doing where you're obtaining those, those um, resources. And then factors in your body, like your physiology or where exactly you are in the food chain are all going to combine together um, to change the actual isotope value that you get at the end. And because those are related to factors that we've measured in labs and we understand, um, we can actually quantify the values of isotopes in a given animal and, and make inferences then of what its physiology was like or what it was eating or what habitats it was living in. And so as a result, it's a really powerful tool because in the fossil record, we almost never actually have preserved behavior. We might have things like um, very rare, rare instances of this, like um, a bone with bite marks on it or something, or footprints or, or something like that, where we can get an idea of what an animal was doing. But this allows us to actually look at the chemistry inside the bones of the animal and get a record of what it did in its life. And so, now we can use that to get at those same questions we were talking about before. If we look at the ceratopsians and the hadrosaurs in this microsite and look at their oxygen and their carbon isotopes in this case, um, what those values are will tell us if these animals are strongly preferring to live in coastal habitats versus inland forested ones. Um, because things like the oxygen values can be strongly influenced by whether you're near coastal areas and getting food and, and water from your coastal areas. And if you're inland, 
Um, same thing for freshwater living in closed canopy tree areas versus more open landscapes will affect the type of carbon values you have as well as a few other factors. So all these things together will allow us to actually test these questions. And then on top of that, we have the carbon, which can give us um, some rough ideas of the diet and uh, again, rough ideas of where they are in the food chain. And so we actually ran those analyses. We get graphs like this. Um, what our numbers basically show us is that while we recover a number of signals in our isotope values that are biologically interesting, like how we have um, evidence that the tyrannosaurs um, have values that are exactly where you'd expect them to be if they were eating things like duckbills, ceratopsians, and ankylosaurs, same deal with the fish versus the crocodilians. If they're preying on the fish, this is exactly where you'd expect their isotope values to be. Um, you also get separation on the entire data set between where the aquatic animals would be versus terrestrial ones, as you would predict. So all these things are sort of making sense. But what we don't see is strong separation among the plant eaters. We find them all grouping pretty closely together, suggesting that they're living in sort of the same habitats, eating the same things. Um, and there is no evidence here that some of them are going to coastal areas versus more inland areas. And so that really doesn't put a nail in the coffin for it, but it, it certainly strongly suggests that this hypothesis was wrong, that these animals were actually doing something different in order to avoid competition. Um, but while we have these isotope data, another cool thing we can do that I'll just touch on quickly before wrapping up is we can use these things to get a, a, as a proxy for the environment. We can actually figure out what the temperature was at this time by looking at the isotopes in these teeth. And um, the way we do that is by um, some different equations that have been developed that look at the physiology, these uh, predictive physiology of different groups of animals um, and a number of other factors to calculate out what um, water isotope values were and what their body water, body isotope values were and then calculate temperatures. And so we are applying these here to try and figure out what the temperature was in the Cretaceous of sort of Alberta, Montana 75 million years ago. Before we actually did it, we wanted to just quickly do a little test um, and we collected data that were very similar from animals living today in Southern Louisiana in this big wetland system that's environmentally somewhat similar to the areas in the Cretaceous we're looking at. We did the same method, calculated a temperature from their oxygen isotope values and found that it was about a degree or two from um, the actual measured mean annual temperature that um, the United States Geological Survey and, and, the, and NOAA had measured with monitoring stations they have in the area where they're taking temperature measurements of the water in the air every 15 minutes. Um, our values from these animals' teeth end up within about a degree or two estimate of that, which is quite good. And so we did the same thing on the fossils and we end up with a mean annual temperature of around 17, 18 degrees Celsius in um, this area 75 million years ago, which is relatively similar. It's, it's a little colder than Louisiana is right now, but it's relatively similar to a lot of the sort of Southeast, um, particularly actually the Carolinas. So South Carolina, North Carolina would have probably been very similar in, in year round temperatures to what Alberta and Montana were 75 million years ago. And those areas were obviously very different today where you get extremely cold winters in places like that. Um, Summers are still relatively warm, but you have extreme seasonality. It's often very dry. Um, and that was, from our data, not at all what those areas were like 75 million years ago. And so just to quickly wrap up, um, our work is ongoing here, but we're already finding like really good data to reconstruct these ecosystems. And we're finding that while we can very easily record how animal populations and ecosystems are responding to things like climate change um, 75 million years ago, we're not actually seeing that the dinosaurs responded to them very well, or rather um, that they weren't sensitive to them. So if they were not segregating their ecosystems and their habitat use the way it had been previously predicted, how exactly were these plant-eating dinosaurs managing to coexist? Um, well, we're actually looking at that right now by looking at a suite of additional analyses using different isotopes that should allow us to um, figure out that gradation in even finer detail exactly like where exactly where in the landscape they're using, um, what kind of plants they're eating, what the food web structure was like. And it might even be something as simple as they're eating the same plants with different parts of it by height, or that competition was simply not as um, serious an issue because um, different levels of productivity. And we'll hopefully have an answer for that pretty soon. 
And so with that, I just want to thank um, a large number of people for different uh, contributions and collaborations, funding agencies that have helped fund my research, um, and all of you for listening. And uh, hopefully you can answer some questions now. Tom, thank you very much. Excellent stuff. I, you know, so I've hosted a lot of science cafes across all kinds of topics. And it is always amazing to see how deep researchers can really go into some of these topics. You know, you say, oh, we're going to talk about dinosaurs. And the first thing that jumps into my mind, or maybe somebody else's mind too, is, okay, well, let's talk about uh, the, the giant predators and how they ate their giant prey. <laughs> and that's your dinosaurs. But well, I mean, we're, we get to dig at, get at that a little bit with the, uh, with the predator prey stuff, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But, you know, to, to take it down to like just the tiniest little fossils that still remain that you can pull out and, and go through 50 pound sacks of, which seems like a lot of work, I gotta say. It's a little bit of work, yeah. <laughs> but, but but the kinds of questions that you can that you can answer using even the smallest uh, of remnants, that's pretty incredible. Yeah, I agree, and it's it's sort of both sides of a coin, right? Like I also work on um, describing skeletons and, and stuff like that. I, I do the sort of traditional paleontology as well. Um, and we need to have that work to actually understand what species are there because you need the good examples of the, the specimen to actually describe the, their anatomy. Once you have that, then you can use the sort of scrappier bits like I'm finding um, to record their occurrences and track their ecology. But obviously the thing that's powerful about um, the sites that we're using for this research is that we can actually get the sort of numbers um, that we need to, to do these more complex analyses. We only have like a half a dozen things. We can't do anything with statistical um, confidence. When we have 75,000 fossils, well, then now we're talking. So uh, I'm going to go, we've had a few questions come in. All right. So the somebody viewing actually has a degree in laser technology. Oh. So they were, so they posted this one early. They were interested in how you actually use the lasers. Is it spectroscopy, LIDAR, fossil, or terrain scanning? Or can you uh, use lasers even in carbon dating? You yeah, kind of got so, to it. Yeah, so we kind of got to it, I guess. But yeah, we're using a, a CO2 laser mounted to a um, gas chromatography mass spectrometer. And then Elias is asking, what was the average annual temperature in the Hell Creek formation? Oh, that's a slightly harder one. Um, <laughs> that's very I'm interesting. To, I, no, I, it's a good question. I actually read a paper on this like six months ago, I've got to try and remember the numbers. Um, it was slightly colder than the numbers we are getting for Montana and Alberta 75 million years ago. So in the Hell Creek, which is like 67-ish, um, it's slightly colder than that. So I think like um, somewhere in the area of like annual 15 degrees Celsius sort of thing, mid 30s or, or mid 20s to 30s summer temperatures, which would be like high 80s, I think. I'm still, I apologize. I've been living in the US for a couple of years now, but I'm still bad on my conversions to, to Fahrenheit for these things. I just do it in like 10 degree increments. <laughs> <laughs> but um, well, you can give it to us in centigrade and then. Yeah, so it'd be can, like. You can Google the conversion. Summer is in the high 20s, um, annual temperature in the in the teens, like low teens, um, Celsius, which would be like, I think 60 ish degrees Fahrenheit at like annual temperature, mean annual temperature. Don't like quote me on that. Cause I'm, I'm trying to remember what the people said in this, in this research paper from a few months ago, but I think it's in that ballpark. It's, it's similar to we're getting, um, for the about 10 million years before, but several like four or five degrees colder. They really need the answer to that when they can go to Google scholar, right. And yeah, pull up the paper. and they can also like message me on Twitter or something. I can I can give them the paper that has that exact information in it. There we go. There we go. That's a good solution for that one. Okay, uh, let's see. Beth on Facebook is asking, my 11 year old would like to know what is your favorite part of being a paleontologist? 
Ooh, um, I think my favorite part is being able to do cool field work. That's, that's probably my overall favorite. Like I love being able to go to these remote areas and just spend a few weeks or even a month um, hiking every day, digging up dinosaurs, like seeing great scenery. Um, it's just it's pretty much my favorite thing in the world. I, so I saw on your uh, Twitter profile that you were interested in photography and then found an album of your photos. And yeah, some of these landscapes are amazing. Just gorgeous places to spend time. Yeah, it's, it's really cool. And um, I personally don't like hot weather. So there's the downside for me for some of this field work is that all the bloody dinosaurs have, have to show up in hot deserts. But um, uh, it's well worth it, I think. And, and as you said, yeah, the, there, it's quite spectacular areas to work in. So even if you're sweating all the time, it's like, well, at least it's like, like nice views. <laughs> so I'm curious, um, early in the talk, you, you, you were talking about reconstructing ecosystems and how you go to look for dinosaurs and you want to find the dinosaurs in the same sort of strata of rock. Yeah. You can say these are from the same time. And then you're trying to piece together the ecosystems. Is it always the fossils that you pull out, micro fossils or otherwise, that tell you what this ecosystem was like? Or are there other things in the landscape today that give you clues about its ancient history? Uh, it's mostly in the stuff we pull out, but um, the, t the way the topography works does relate to the underlying geology. So um, the sediments that are there that are hosting those fossils can tell us most of the story about what the actual environment was like, if not the ecosystem itself. And um, from a distance, you can actually see um, some of the like geometry of what that ancient ecosystem looked like. In a lot of these pictures of Badlands, um, to the trained eye, when you're looking at the like the different colored bands of, of the sandstones and stuff, you can actually sometimes track where a channel used to be. You can see like stacks of like these sort of sort of V or cup shaped channels in the rock on top of one another, and that's actually what like a cross section through an ancient river, and you can actually see like oh the river would have been here like going this sort of orientation at that time. So you can actually get some of those um, landscape information um, points just from like looking at a rock wall without even having to pull anything out of it. Leah is asking, can you tell us about what it's like to be in the field on a dino dig? Um, sure. It's, you normally, like you're all in tents, um, you normally get up at sunrise, have a quick breakfast, then walk for a few miles out to a field site. Um, the first and sort of last days of field work are usually the worst because they're the ones where there's lots of like set up and carrying all the heavy things. But um, on any regular day, you sort of, yeah, you get up, you make your way out to a quarry, and then you, uh, you start digging and mapping and collecting material and putting plaster jackets on stuff. And you normally do that for seven or eight hours and then sort of like come back at night, make some dinner. And then depending on where you are, either sit around around a campfire if you're lucky, or if you're in an area sometimes where there's either no wood at all, or you're not allowed because it's too dry to, to have fires. So just sit around and um, chat with people for a few hours and head to bed. Um, a lot of times during field work, the parts that I like the best um, even though working in a quarry is a lot of fun and obviously having a guaranteed like set of bones in front of you is, is super um, great because you can actually be productive and like uncover stuff and uh, clear it out and collect it. And like, you're definitely working towards a goal. One of my favorite things during field work is the sort of step before that, the prospecting where we might spend all day long walking around and you're doing dozens and dozens of miles of, of hiking in around the badlands just because you're, always wondering what's around that next bend. You're wondering like, oh, am I gonna come across and find like a new species? Like, and a lot of times you may not find anything, but um, you're just covering ground and, and finding cool fossils. And um, the days that are like that are a lot more, are a lot, to me, a lot more exciting. Um, but uh, overall, yeah, it's it's sort of like camping, but instead of going out like fishing during the day, you go out and sit in a hole in the ground and, and, and chip away to like dig up, dig up the fossils. I mean, it sounds like it would be a pretty fun thing to get to do. Yeah, it definitely is. Um, 
and there's often opportunities. I'm trying, um, I'm trying to get that plane ticket. <laughs> Is there a seat for me on the truck? I'll talk to Lindsay. Um, <laughs> but uh, there's often opportunities for things like, I mean, if, if someone has the means and the time to volunteer on certain crews or else um, for students, there's often like internship things to, to participate in some of these digs. Some museums also run um, like public digs. Like I know the Burpee Museum up in um, Burpee, Illinois does things like that um, and a number of others where they'll actually take people out to like an unknown quarry and that they're working every year. It's often ones that are super rich, full of full bones and you can get some experience actually um, seeing what it's like. Nice, nice. Okay, more questions for you from the internet. Uh, the folks on the North Carolina Environmental Education Twitter from the Office of Environmental Education wanna know, if you think studying ancient ecosystems can help us understand and conserve the ecosystems that exist today? I do, absolutely. I think that, um, I think that's a really good question. And I think that um, these sort of fossil ecosystems actually can play a key role in trying to predict how things are gonna change in the future. Obviously we have a factor now that's not, wasn't present in a lot of these ancient systems like human beings uh, in industrial activity and, and things like that. But um, what this gives us is an example of how ecosystems would play out, how things would change, what would go extinct, um, what's most vulnerable under things like climate change or other sort of um, environmental changes or catastrophes or even more rare events like a uh, asteroid from the sky, how different groups of animals and plants respond to major perturbations like that, major extinctions, major climate changes in a normal background way um, gives us, I think, important baseline information for making our predictions into the future. We want to know what species we should target for, for conservation um, as priorities or uh, which areas are going to be more affected by certain climate changes or how ranges of species might shift as things get warmer. Um, having that kind of background information of like how would it have happened in the past is really critical because then we can add in the human factor to it and, and make more informed choices about how we manage these ecosystems and environments. That's a brilliant answer. I may have been asked it once or twice before. Right. <laughs> but I mean, that that's really great to, um, wow, to think about, understand the way things were back then, how they changed, and then add in us to see how things could continue to change. It's inspired. Inspired is what it is. Okay, I've got more questions for you. Is it difficult to obtain permits for excavating in Canada or the US? Um, it's not super difficult. It depends on what you want to do and where you want to do it. Um, in the US, to, you need permits for like BLM or state land, things like that. And one of the steps involved typically is you actually have to be at particular institutions um, or provide different information of like what the purpose of your excavating is. It's not just like, I just want to go out and dig up a dinosaur kind of thing. Like you have to explain what the rationale is, why they're, they should let you go out and like disturb this land to do this or that. So um, there's often a fair amount of paperwork involved, but it's none of it's super difficult. Um, in Canada, it works roughly the same, but if anything, it's a little bit less complicated. Um, whereas in the US, there's like multiple parallel systems, depending on what agency is responsible for what land, um, whether it's like federal BLM or like federal parks, forest service, um, or it's a state thing. In the Canadian system, it varies by province, but in some of the dinosaur rich places like Alberta, it's all managed by the province and it's basically all the land and all the fossils are managed through the provincial government. And so even on places like private land, uh, the fossils actually belong to like the state. Whereas in the US, um, if it's on private land, it's yours. And if it's on government land, you need permits to, to excavate. So it's, it's slightly different systems. It's more streamlined and a little more uniform than the Canadian system, but there's in the Canadian system, there doesn't, there's no um, private ownership component um, Whereas in the U.S., having that private land part makes it a lot easier if you are someone who wants to excavate and you have stuff on your land. All right. Eric's got our next question. Does our knowledge of the landscapes help us understand the behavior of the dinosaurs? Um, 
Yeah, I think it does. The um, the type of landscapes these animals were living in can be pretty informative for trying to reconstruct what their habits would have been, um, how are they moving around, what they were eating. Because if we think about if they were living in like a broad plain versus um, an area with like big river channels versus um, like really like forested swamps, those are going to have obviously important differences to how something that's the size of like a tank is moving around, um, let alone the things that are much smaller. And um, yeah, I think it, it is pretty important to be able to characterize that as part of the, the full picture of, of um, the ec ecosystems and ecology of these animals. And um, if I can add one more thing, um, another thing that is that behaviorally, if we think like um, some of the sites that are in places like Mongolia, where it's very desert-like today, and even back then there's evidence of um, somewhat desert conditions and dry in certain places, that can tell you a lot about what the behavior might have been, because that means that where water sources were, um, wherever there, there was a river in this extremely dry area, you're going to have animals concentrating around it. And that might inform um, some of the dinosaurs you find and why you find certain types of dinosaurs in certain concentrations in certain environments, because um, you have to think about how would those animals have been living and interacting with that environment. And so I think um, all those things sort of work together for it. All right, let's see the next one on YouTube. Username, I am a Switch player, says, uh, talk about Indosuchus or Suchus, Indo O Suchus. Okay. Do you know anything about Indo? What would you like me to talk about for it? <laughs> uh, let's start with my knowledge of Indosuchus. What is it? Um, so, is it a dinosaur? Oh, hold on. I think. Oh, never mind. Um, the audio cut out for a second. Did you say, is it a dinosaur? I did. Yeah, it is. But um, it's an abelosaur. I just don't. Like, I don't know a lot about it. I've never worked on a, a Belosaurus before, so I'm afraid I, I can't give you a ton. <laughs> gotcha, no worries. Uh, let's see. DB is, sorry if they missed this part, but what was the part about T-Rex ancestors being the size of deer? Oh, um, that's probably some of Lindsay's work. The uh, Moros. I assume that's what that's referring to. Oh, yes, yes. So... Um, Moros was a Tyrannosauroid um, dinosaur, so that's like a, a relative of T. Rex, and it lived quite a bit before T. Rex itself was around. But yeah, it was around the size of a deer, really small animal, and at the time, um, Tyrannosaurs of this size were probably making up a, a very different role in the ecosystem compared to where they did by the time at the end of the Cretaceous when they're a dominant predator and they're 40 feet long and as T-Rex at the time, the Tyrannosaurids are, yeah, deer sized and probably in the shadow to some extent of these really big, um, like, um, Carcharodontosaurus and things like that. These, uh, animals that by the time of T-Rex were more found in, in like Africa and South America, they're quite common still at this point in, in, um, um, in North America. And so you see a bit of a replacement over time where things like Al like allosaurs and carcharodontosaurs, things like that, that had been more common in the Jurassic in the early parts of the Cretaceous in North America start to slowly disappear. And then you have tyrannosaurs fill that niche and become the dominant predators. But they started out small as uh, most big animals um, at some point in their evolutionary history started out pretty small. Can I, can I ask you about your experience working at the Field Museum? Sue the T-Rex is a little bit of a famous specimen. So yeah, I'm just curious about uh, what it's like to, to work on such a, an important fossil. It was kind of nerve wracking at first, to be honest. Um, so in addition to working on the exhibit for it, which was a lot of fun, um, the research we were doing, which is currently in peer review, and so will hopefully be out soon, involved looking at um, uh, using it as an, along with a number of different specimens to look at how some of these big um, meat-eating dinosaurs actually reached large sizes. And one of the tasks we had to do for that was to take um, a histological sample, so like a tissue sample from the bones of Sue, and um, 
unfortunately that meant having to drill a, like a hole into one of Sue's femora, uh, oh, one of her okay. thigh bones. And so the one of the first things I did at the Field Museum, like I think two or three months on the job, was get the drill press with like the special coring bit. And it, like we put one of Sue's limb bones there and I had to drill it. And a bunch of the museum, like education and PR people were there filming it. And um, it's kind of nerve wracking because I was like, what happens if I break it? Are you just going to fire me immediately for like damaging this multi-million dollar specimen? But thankfully oh, yeah. it went really well and we got a perfect sample. So um, hopefully we'll be able to share some interesting data on um, the growth of uh, some of these big dinosaurs like T-Rex in uh, the next few months. Something to keep a lookout for everybody. Uh, let's see. Looks like I've got one last question for you. As good a question as any to, to wrap up our hour. Any advice for kids who want to be paleontologists? Um, yeah, I guess um, it's not going to probably be super satisfying because it's like, there's a, if, you've, if you're really interested in becoming a paleontologist, um, obviously going into some kind of a school for geology or biology is a great way to start for that. Um, like many other fields, there's no, no one path to get there. So there's really not one thing I can say, like, if you do this, you'll definitely be a paleontologist. Um, and in fact, many people I know have gotten into the field through all sorts of different pathways. So um, eventually some degree of like graduate school in biology and or geology to do like paleo research will probably be required. But um, I think like, going to museums, um, seeing if there's paleontology being done there, seeing if the, there's any opportunities to volunteer to like um, work with the paleontologists there, work in their fossil programs. That's a potential way to start. That's part, one of the ways that I got my start was being able to do a little bit of summer volunteering um, at a local natural history museum. And I know that's how a lot of people got sort of there in, but if you can't do that, there are other ways to do it as well. And I think, yeah, just, having an interest in the natural world and um, studying a lot of biology, geology, and math, probably helpful. I know when I was a kid, I, in my head, I was like, well, I want to be a paleontologist and I won't need math because I'll be looking at dinosaur bones. But unfortunately, you need math for everything. So I, I, couldn't, I couldn't escape it. Eventually, I just had to relearn learn it all anyway. But um, yeah, I think looking into, into museums and paleontologists and seeing opportunities to, to sort of get an in there is, is one of the main ways I would say is um, to get your, can get yourself some early exposure to the field. And, you know, your response to that reminded me that you had mentioned uh, a citizen science project with microfossils. Yeah. Uh, so, something that's coming up in the future or that folks can learn about now? Um, it's coming up in the future. So okay. through the North Carolina Museum, we're going to be doing some, we're developing some of it right now. And obviously there's been some delays because of the pandemic, but um, we'll be doing some microsite related citizen science programs, hopefully next starting next year, or hopefully starting early next year. We'll be, we'll be in big trouble if it doesn't launch at all next year, but um, uh, we'll be able to talk about that more in the future. But yeah, the, the, the goal is we'll have some programs for that. There are, already, there are some existing programs through the museum um, that involve fossils though. So there's some of the long going um, um, like shark tooth citizen science projects that, um, are being run by um, uh, Terry Gates, who is um, associated with the museum and is a lecturer at uh, NC State and a paleontologist. And he's been running some cool programs with that for a number of years now. So I think that is still, I think, ongoing. And, um, and that's based on North Carolina shark fossils. So there's, there's a local aspect to that that's pretty cool, including some of the big like megalodon, like the really big uh, like shark teeth that are like this big kind of thing. So there's some, definitely some opportunities in, the, in like the Raleigh area for doing some paleo citizen science right now. And in the future, there'll be even more once we get our stuff up and running. Excellent, wonderful. You know what, one, one more question came in okay. while we were just chatting there. Um, and I'm just gonna read it to you because uh, it sounds like even though we're kind of close to wrapping things up, this, this might cause a debate. Oh, okay. So hold on. Here we go. Alex Psy Channel wants to know, 
I recently read the paper contributed by Lindsay published this year about Tyrannosaurus growth. Despite that, I'm convinced that nano T is invalid. I'm interested on your take on T-Rex osteohistology. So they're convinced that nano Tyrannus is invalid. Yes. Or is valid. It, uh, nano T is invalid. Oh, okay. I, isn't that the conclusion of that paper? I, yeah, that's what Zano. Um, that, Cause that's Hollywood all wrote. wrote, I think, right? Um, says, despite that, I'm convinced that nano T is invalid. Oh, okay. Well, I Alex, think... if you're watching and we got it wrong, let me know. Yeah, I mean, let us know. For that paper, um, I don't want to say too much. I don't want to get Holly mad at me. But uh, I think the really cool paper, um, I'm not as convinced that it fully answers the question as I think the text of the paper says. But um, the data are, inc are really, really good. And the osteostology in it, I think, is pretty solid. It's just that as juveniles, um, these tyrannosaurs had a somewhat extended um, period of slower growth, after which they would have had their, their big growth spurt like we see in, in T-Rex. Um, I guess like the alternative hypothesis is that the animals they sectioned could be nanotyrannus, in which case they would just be almost fully grown nanotyrannus, but not quite. But um, I think they do make a, a, a good enough argument in there that um, it's more likely that they're T-Rex. And I think the osteostology in it is pretty solid. Alex there's... wrote, oh, okay. Uh, Alex did mean to say not convinced. Oh, not convinced. That, invalid? Not okay. convinced that nano T is invalid. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't think that that paper is like the nail in the coffin of that question. Um, and I think there are still questions out there. I think that there's certainly an alternative interpretation of the data from that paper that those specimens could represent just like sub-adults of a nanotyrannus type animal um, as opposed to a juvenile T-Rex. I lean more on the side that they're a juvenile T-Rex, but I'm, I'm not convinced in 100% either. Um, but I think, again, like the data in the paper were really good. And um, I think there's certainly more to be done on the nanotyrannus question. And uh, given how many different people are working on it for a single animal that's known from a handful of specimens, I'm sure there will be more more out on that very soon because paleontologists are well aware um, just how how um, much of interest that particular question is. So people are definitely working on trying to solve it. And I I know Holly herself is is working on some follow up uh, research projects on more transfer growth. So there'll definitely be some even more in depth work coming out of out of uh, her lab in the future on this. It's amazing that a science that looks at prehistory, ancient history continues to rewrite itself and answer and invent more questions. Like there's just so much more to learn, even though all of the information would seem to just sort of be there. You pull the bone up out of the ground and look at it, but no, there's, there's always new lines of inquiry. There's always fresh and, and good science to be done. Yeah, absolutely. And it just seems the more we find, the more questions we have, which is a good problem to have, I think. Just got to keep turning your lasers on them. <laughs> That's the plan. That's what we're going to do. Tom, <laughs> thanks so much for, for being here and for doing the Science Cafe with us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, it's my pleasure. It was a lot of fun. And uh, to all of you watching at home, wherever you happen to be, thanks for joining us for the Virtual Science Cafe. Make sure you check out the museum on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're at Natural Sciences. If you visit the museum's website, naturalsciences.org, there's a big link for the Science at Home page. There you can see do-it-yourself science activities, our archive of videos, and the schedule for more live events that are coming up. For example, we'll be back here at 7 o'clock for the next Virtual Science Cafe next Thursday night. And we'll be talking with birder extraordinaire, David Allen Sibley. If you've ever heard of a Sibley's field guide, we're gonna have the one and only David Sibley here with the museum to talk about his expertise, his writing on birds, his work. So don't miss that one. Check out naturalsciences.org to get all the information on uh, next week's Science Cafe. Tom, again, thank you very much. Well, thank yeah, thanks again for having me, and and thanks to everyone watching for uh, for listening. It's been a lot of fun.
with that, we'll sign off. Good night, everybody.